Uh, thank you, Jamie, for that introduction. Um, and I'd also like to thank the people that um, work with us or who have worked with us um, for their contribution to our practice, especially Christine Williams and also Rebecca Beyer Winnick. Um, <clears throat> I'd also like to thank the institutions where we work. Um, as Jamie mentioned, um, uh, the support of Vassar College, where Tobias works, MICA, where Dan works, and NGIT, where I work. Um, <clears throat> so in the early days, um, at our firm back in 2005, we had the honor of winning the Architectural League's Young Architects Forum. And in our presentation inside the Oligopticon at the Urban Center, um, we proposed an expanded design philosophy, um, at the heart of which is the idea that architecture's ability to act is tied on its own ability to recognize those that act on it. And so building on this philosophy, we've spent the past six years developing and implementing projects that represent an ever-expanding concept of what architecture is. And as Jamie cited, um, how it acts on the world, but also how it's acted upon by individuals, institutions, ideas, idealizations, and objects. Um, so winning the, uh, the support of the Architectural League at that very early moment in our firm's history was so important in shaping our practice. So we want to thank Rosalie and Greg and Nick and others for, for, that, for that support. Um, since then, we've developed and implemented um, urban design projects uh, such as Lens Space that deal directly with the public realm, uh, expanding accessibility and use value of urban space for a variety of constituencies, including the undesirables. Um, we've done neighborhood planning. We recently completed a redevelopment plan for a neighborhood in Newark, New Jersey. And here we tested and developed new ways to expand and increase participation um, in the planning process. And so um, in an effort to get um, more participation in this project, um, we set up a shop at a bus stop and presented a colorful model of the neighborhood and invited people just to talk to us. Um, and second, we also made uh, self-addressed postage paid postcards that we left in bars and hair salons and other everyday spaces. Um, and we put images of the uh, neighborhood on them and we asked people to simply caption them. And of course, when we look at this, being sort of trained as urban designers and planners, we saw uh, mixed use, as many of you probably would. Um, but for um, other people in uh, that community, uh, it turned out that it's a great place to deal drugs. So, um, in our, and so it sort of showed us that it's always important to see the city through lots of different eyes. Um, and this is one of the uh, ways in which we do this. Um, we've also done a number of research projects, uh, such as one that we're currently doing about the elderly in New York City. Um, which was supported by the Architectural League. Um, it turns out that um, a disproportionate number of elderly um, in New York live in uh, so-called towers in the park, um, in limited equity housing cooperatives that were built by the unions in the 1950s. And um, in fact, many of them have been declared, uh, they've declared themselves NORCs, naturally occurring retirement communities. And so um, these groups uh, seek to retroactively turn these buildings into retirement homes um, so we're investigating how these towers have found a second calling, so to speak, as a place for people to age in place. And it's a project that we're really excited about. And in fact, we've developed a series of projects that make larger urban dynamics more accessible, visible, and negotiable for uh, wider audiences. Um, as urban design fellows for the Design Trust for Public Space, uh, we visualize the ecologies of the garment district. And uh, we followed up our fellowship with a project called What's Going On in the Garment District. Um, it's a section um, through the Garment District, and it's really about two things. One, <clears throat> the importance of creative clustering, um, but two, the problem of knowing a place. So if you scroll around and you, find, you can find out what this or that person is doing, and occasionally you can click on someone and see more, you might get a comic, you might get a timeline, you might get an axonometric. It's oligoptic, to borrow a phrase from Bruno Latour. Um, we develop work for exhibitions. Um, our project, In the Meantime, Life with Land Banking, uh, was commissioned by the Walker Art Center to, um, uh, to, to, for a piece which we turned um, this mundane story of a dead shopping mall um, in upstate New York into an autobiographical film. And we also work as, oops, and we also work as curators. Um, uh, as, for example, in the 2009 uh, Rotterdam Architecture Biennial, uh, which we'll talk about uh, later. So uh, we really take on, um, as I think Jamie referenced, 
Uh, we really take on a wide variety of roles as architects, and we tackle a wide variety of project types, and we develop a wide variety of deliverables. But our projects share a number of common threads, so um, let us show you a few in detail. We would actually like to start with a project that Georgina just mentioned uh, in the meantime, Life with Land Banking, which is an old project, embarrassingly old, uh, something that we had just finished when we received the Young Architects uh, Award in 2005. But we want to show it a little, uh, you a little bit of this project because it was really important in defining our trajectory since uh, getting the, the Young Architects Award. Uh, and it had kind of a funny afterlife as well, as you will see in a minute. So it's called, in the meantime, Life with Land Banking, and it's dealing with the fate of a dead shopping mall in Dutchess County, New York. Um, here you see it, the Dutchess Mall uh, in Fishkill, New York. Uh, it's a mall that was built in 1974 with the dumbbell structure that is typical for malls of that generation, with these two anchor stores and an enclosed corridor in the middle. Um, it's very large, as you see here, when you overlay the, the plan of the mall in the parking lot on uh, Midtown Manhattan. A very large structure, but it was never actually really successful, uh, which has to do with the micro-location of this, of this mall in relation to the highway exit. So it never really took off, it sort of floundered for a couple of years, and then closed its doors in the 1990s. Um, when we entered the picture in 2004, the owners of this place, uh, New York City-based developers, um, admitted that they were land banking the site, so they weren't doing anything. They were just claiming their property as a tax write-off, and they were fine with waiting for a little while until, this, and they, until they could redevelop the site or sell it off. Um, so um, really just holding on to a site where nothing happens, which of course was not great for the community. Uh, people were upset to have this huge, huge structure sitting there basically vacant. Um, but when we, when we entered the picture, we decided to not be critical of land banking, but to look at it as, a, as an opportunity, right? As an opp this delay in development and as an opportunity for things to happen here that, um, that otherwise wouldn't happen, right? A temporary location for stuff that uh, finds its place there. In fact, when we were hanging out there, we found that there was already a lot of stuff going on there. There was a bus that was serving this supposedly dead place. There was, uh, were people waiting for buses. There was a, uh, a bus stop that doubled as a dry cleaning business. There were these. There were RVs. There were rigs. There were homes other miscellaneous activities. And then there was this, this guy who was uh, driving around in his golf cabbie cleaning up the parking lot. Some mysterious reason, heading off. There were hot dog stands. And then on weekends there was a f crazy flea market that actually made this the most happening places in, in Dutchess County on, on Saturdays, both the parking lot and then the um, old department store here that was turned into this, this, um, this flea market here. You see the KISS uh, memorabilia stand. Um, so we, um, we mapped all these observations after hanging out there for a really, really long time. We mapped out all these observations that we found um, and um, uh, sort of two diagrams, just um, a, a cardiogram of the place. This was 1974 when the place first um, opened up. You see here very healthy pulse. Uh, these were the current, at that point, um, uh, active programs, so you see a very weak pulse. Um, then we also looked at the temporary programs, like the flea market and so on, that picked up on the weekend. So you see here the, uh, how the cardiogram picks up on Saturdays and Sundays. And finally, we mapped out the illicit or um, uh, illegal programs here that were taking place, and there was just no predicting when they would uh, pick up. So this was uh, the picture of uh, arrhythmia. Um, but um, so um, we tried to identify a lot of the um, local constituents, um, um, like like this guy here. That was uh, remember the the hot dog guy that uh, that uh, that I showed you before. Um, this is um, a, his name is Jay. And he had noticed that after the uh, decline of the closing of the mall, um, truckers started pulling into the, the parking lot uh, just really um, to, to stay there overnight. And he then opened this little hot dog stand as a sort of makeshift um, um, you know, rest stop for them. Um, so 
We, we, we talk to uh, constituents like him um, on site, people using the site every day, but then also to uh, other constituents, off-site constituents like the developers, local planning office, and, and so on, just to really find out about their interests, speculate about their hopes or visions for the site. And this is uh, what we think sort of it's part of our work, right? Good, thorough detective work, listening, hanging around, looking for clues, suspending judgment for a long time in order to uh, acquire some kind of located knowledge, right? Pe uh, things that people know who use a site that we don't know as, as outsiders. Um, and so, so we really then tried in our design proposal, tried to use that located knowledge to, to generate a design proposal. Uh, as you've seen, after the big shopping program had moved out, all sorts of people started using the site for all sorts of things. And we sort of decided to build on that logic and follow that logic and um, started proposing all kinds of new things um, that make some sort of sense here. Um, so a, a fragmentary logic, not some sort of overall plan, right? So this is in a way you could say the opposite of traditional master planning where you have a big vision and then derive the details from there. Here we basically, um, uh, uh, developed uh, or accumulated a basically unendless number of proposals up to a point where some new urbanity uh, might emerge. I'm going to uh, take you through these proposals. Uh, there are many, many of them. There are a bunch of them that intensify existing um, in, uh, dynamics in order to get a you know, a short-term use value out of it, like um, incubators that help small firms colonize the mall structure from the outside in. Uh, then there were short-term interventions that weren't so much in, uh, um, based on or planning to grow something new out of the temporary mess, but uh, exploit the temporary mess to its fullest, uh, nightclubs and that sort of thing. And then there were proposals that built on the sort of casually, uh, mainly car-oriented community uses that are already taking place here. Um, and, but again, the, the, uh, the, there were many, many of these proposals, but again, they, they were not designed, they were de designed for a very limited period, for the limited period of land banking. And our thesis here was that an in-between time like this sometimes allows programs and buildings to happen that otherwise might not have a chance, right? And it might d disappear after the, this sort of uh, lab time, but that also might influence whatever happens here after this experimental phase, sort of changing the site's DNA for the future. Um, keep that thought in mind for a moment. Um, we'll get back to that. So uh, well, to, next we want to talk about a project called Improve Your Lot. And uh, this is also an older project from 2004. It began as a winning submission to the uh, Shrinking Cities Reinventing Urbanism competition. And uh, the competition asks uh, architects and planners to confront the phenomenon of shrinkage in one of four cities around the world. We worked with the city of Detroit. And the project starts uh, where a lot of projects about Detroit start, with a graph like this. Yes, Detroit has lost about a million people in the past 50 years. Uh, and yes, Detroit has an unfathomable amount of vacant land. But this project says, let's not let the, uh, the um, familiar narrative of abandonment get the best of us. And uh, let's also resist the temptation to uh, romance this, the, uh, the city's ruins, as, as, as you see in, in a lot of art projects and photography projects and city planning commission projects to rope off the city and let it revert to nature. Um, we, so we think that, uh, aside from being a bit too spectacular for our taste, these two visions uh, tend to overlook two important facts about vacant land in Detroit. Uh, number one, uh, most of them are not s huge swaths of vacant land. They're actually missing teeth single parcels between existing homes. And by the way, Detroit's still a city of 800,000 people. Uh, and uh, two, recently, many of these, uh, these lots have been bought up not by developers, not by speculators, but by the owners of adjacent homes. Uh, as you can see in some of these pictures. So we have a name for this, we call this a blot. When, homeowner, when a homeowner takes, borrows, or buys one or more adjacent lots, the connected lots form a blot. Uh, and uh, improve your lot is really our attempt to uh, do document this phenomenon, think through and envision some of its implications, and finally invent mechanisms to help it along a little bit, or what we call ghostwrite it. I'll talk about it in a minute. Why are we doing this? Uh, well, nobody is really paying attention to this phenomenon, uh, but uh, it's happening everywhere, uh, all over Detroit. And, and when we do notice, we see something very interesting. We see that this is an interesting epilogue to the familiar narrative of abandonment. And it says that beyond the typical story of Detroit's decline, we can find this, this one way in which individual residents acting out of self-interest make do uh, and actually take advantage of shrinkage by increasing their space and improving their lot. 
so this is, this is a block in Detroit, uh, say 1967, pre-riot block, uh, single family bungalows, 30 by 100 foot lots, uh, no blotting, uh, abandonment kicks in, the city comes in, takes over ownership, cleans and greens the lots, and this is where the story usually stops. But this is where we're interested in th what happens after this and what's, what's happening now, this and this. Think about the large-scale implications of this. Thousands of unsuspecting, self-interested homeowners changing the genetic code of the city, making it less homogenous, and effectively making it more suburban, kind of reducing the city down to a suburban density. Uh, and this is the second reason we study this. And in fact, we have a name for this, the new suburbanism, the cumulative effect of thousands of instances uh, of lot making. Uh, but uh, I think uh, getting ahead of myself a little, let's take a, a look at what some of these blots look like, which, by the way, we found just by driving around the city. Uh, we went into Detroit uh, in, in typical uh, Jake Giddis style with not too much of an agenda. We wanted to practice detective work, and we would notice funny lots like this. And then we would find, you know, trampoline blots and satellite dish blots and swimming pool blots and purely aesthetic formal blots and purely functional blots that were not uh, pretty at all, uh, but were very functional nonetheless. Uh, we, uh, we always identified blots uh, driving around from the f colors of the fences, which often mat match the motifs of these homes. Uh, and uh, we found more permanent uh, additions and, and all kinds of crazy fantasy gardens and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and uh, and uh, we also found a lot of these just, just by looking at the property records. And, and uh, every block we looked at showed evidence of blotting uh, more than one homeowner uh, or the same owner, homeowner owning more than one lot. Uh, so you see, yeah, there are actually some really funny patterns like the Misik family here. They own an entire block of the city and they're sur sur entirely surrounded by uh, city-owned land. So, uh, so for this project, what we did is we, we told a lot of stories about how, how these blots happen uh, and, and what, what, what can we learn from them. And we talked to a lot of the people who, who, do, who make these blots work. And I don't have time to go through all of them. I just want to give you a, a teaser of one. Uh, I'll tell you the story of, uh, of Wanda and Helen, who own these two lots here in, in, uh, in, the, um, in the neighborhood in northeast Detroit. Here's Helen and, and Wanda. So you've got Helen and Wanda in pink. It's a really beautiful story about how they always wanted to live next door to each other. They got really close. They found uh, two houses that were four lots away. What they did is they collectively bought the land in between their house, reparcelized it. Now they have this very interesting thing that no planner or architect would ever design, perhaps, the lot for two on the quarter acre lot versus the typical suburban home on the quarter acre lot. Uh, so we kind of took inspiration from this, and we took inspiration by people like the Andorans who have been building their blot since 1932. Uh, we went and did a lot of property research to find out how these six lot blots, in this case, were accumulated. M Mr. Andrin, who put this blot together, uh, has this uh, on his coffee table. He had his friend with the helicopter fly, fly over and take a picture. He's so proud of the way it looks. Uh, uh, and he did some really clever things, like setting the, the fence back a little so he could maintain his sight views over the street. He, he, he kind of think, thinks of himself as a sort of neighborhood watch person. Um, so I'm going I'm to go through these. This is his block. I'm going to go through these very, very fast. Uh, but there's a lot of lessons embedded, I think, in, in all of these. Uh, and these are all on our website. Um, uh, and, and you can see them. W w one thing I, I do want to mention in, in closing on this project is, um, what is what is the role here for the architect or, or for the planner? Um, you know, on the, on the first hand, it's to make it easier for people to do what they're already doing. Uh, and uh, so the city's done this in a lot of ways, side lot purchase programs. Now the city finally has a land bank, which we're really happy to see. But we think there's another role here for the architect that's kind of analogous to ghostwriting. Um, after all, the job of the ghostwriter is to make their subject sound interesting and important. Uh, in this case, the planner as ghostwriter would try to make uh, the case that the new suburbanism or blotting is crucial to the future of Detroit, that Detroit would have been a lot worse off without Victor, without the people you, you just met, uh, Helen and Wanda. Uh, and how would we do that? I, I, I think uh, by doing in some ways what we're doing in this project, which by the way we're still working on, uh, namely identifying these adjacent lot accumulations as a phenomenon, giving it a name, uh, presenting case studies of the phenomenon, and telling compelling stories. So it's not analysis towards an architecture. We see this uh, as architecture, and we're trying to render this public and incentivize people to do something that they're already doing that we think is good. So we've had blot workshops, for example, in Detroit, where we get these people together to swap stories and a blot blot blog and, a, and all this kind of stuff. So we're trying to kind of render a public here and incentivize people sort of from the, from the bottom up.
We actually developed this idea a little further in the next project we would like to show you, which is just hot off the presses. Uh, this is our winning proposal for uh, MoMA PS1's warm-up. We'll just show you a little bit of this. Hopefully, you will be able to see it with your own eyes in a short time from now, actually a shockingly short time from now. Um, you'll, you'll probably know um, about warm-up. It's a series of summer events at PS1 Long Island City. Every year, MoMA asks uh, a couple of architects to... Um, uh, compete for the construction of a temporary setting and primarily shading uh, for this for this event. Um, and as you might have realized um, by now, we're really interested in the way things are out there, uh, namely sometimes pretty weird. And warm up this series of events is a kind of very weird uh, party, and the weirdness has much to do with the space in which it takes place. Um, for example, funnily, people sit there and always face with their back to the stage, um, or they, um, the handicapped ramp becomes the prime viewing area. Um, then there's also this uh, odd neighboring parcel um, that somehow muscles its way into PS1's territory, giving the neighbors actually the best seat in the in the house. Um, so. Uh, we're interested in the oddness of this space, but obviously it wasn't designed this way. Uh, it's really the result of many circumstances and design decisions over the years. Um, there's obviously the Long Island grid, which is chopped off at this corner by Jackson Avenue. There's this U-shaped um, uh, First Ward School building. Um, then there is um, the neighboring parcel that I mentioned before that sticks into the courtyard here. Uh, the one with the best seat in the house. Then there's, um, in the 1990s, somebody thought it would be a good idea to enclose the entire thing with a giant concrete wall um, here. Um, and um, we asked ourselves, uh, how can we develop a project endogenously out of these eccentricities, um, out of what's already there? And we came up with a pretty simple move. There's uh, 38 holes in this concrete wall um, along Jackson Avenue, about two feet below the uh, top of the wall. And we'll string uh, climbing rope across from these 38 holes across the entire courtyard over to the building. That's pretty much it. Um, there's obviously the neighbors that we don't want to cover, so we have to pull back here a little bit. Um, but so um, just by uh, with this with this simple move, the the result of this of the simple move is sort of a surprising shape. It's a hyperboloid surface uh, that is directly developed out of the architectural elements that um, that uh, that. Um, uh, you know, surround the courtyard. Um, so giving us, uh, we, we call it, we're, we're thinking of a Hugh Ferris-like visualization of the odd parcel conditions here. Um, these are some images of our models. Um, uh, we built this thing, which we're calling the harp. Um, our working model. And it's sort of, it's, it's, it's somewhat, of a, of a, we think it's a rich um, shape that, and we, we very much like that the, this rich shape is simply made out of straight lines and is not derived from some algorithm or something, but it's simply the result of connecting the edges of the courtyard. Um, so here you see our, our working model, and then here you see it in action uh, during warm up. Right? What you see in this rendering is that we're uh, attaching shapes along these ropes, um, shades along these ropes. It's actually a landscaping fabric, a very lightweight landscaping fabric. Um, so our goal here is to create shade and to do so with a calm, free space. Um, providing total flexibility on the ground. Actually, when we were designing this, um, Lena Bobardi's work was in the, in the back of our heads, right? The, the MASP in, in Sao Paulo with this like amazing space that is, um, works for huge demonstrations, but then also for smaller exhibitions. Um, and uh, so we, 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 we wanted to cre cre create a calm, free, flexible, free space for all sorts of things to happen here. And we had a couple of things in mind to happen here. Um, in addition to warm up. Um, as you all know, PS1 is located in, in the borough of Queens, which as you also might know is the most diverse, the most vibrant and the most exciting and probably the best part of New York City. Um, and we asked ourselves, how, um, how can we design something for warm up that has an impact beyond the summer of uh, 2011 and beyond the courtyard of PS1 to strengthen the connections between PS1 and Queens? How can we actually make an environment that lives up to Queens? Um, and, and we did so, we spent a lot of time again in the neighborhood, hanging around and talking to a bunch of people, to, to the neighbors, right, just to see, um, to look beyond the concrete wall and see, um, see what's what else is happening in, um, in, 
Long Island City. One person we talked to, uh, Takis, uh, runs a cab company just across the street. And when the weather is nice, he sets up a makeshift outdoor um, seating area, which you see here, for his employees who change shifts here. So they have a break. Um, uh, one cab driver arrives, waits here, sits there, and uh, then hands over his, 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 his cab. Um, and um, so what this suggested to us is that um, many of the uh, requirements for warm-up, programmatic requirements, seating, shade, and so on, uh, actually um, overlap with the, with the, with the needs of warm-up's neighbors. And this gave us an idea for a kind of radical recycling that, uh, that um, strengthens that connection between the inside and outside here and connects warm up with the, the needs of the neighbors. We actually talked to a lot of the um, organizations. We walked around the neighborhood, talked to the neighbor, to neighbors, institutions, organizations around there, and just asked them if there's something they need um, that we could design, use in the court courtyard during warm up, and then give them in the fall when warm up is over. Now, we talked to lots of organizations, and many of them had actually pretty terrible ideas, right? So we didn't consider those. Um, here, here are all of them uh, on this matrix. Uh, for example, you know, the Long Island City Library wants to get more books. Um, this is on our matrix here, this is in the public interest, but it's not very fun for warm-up to have a bunch of books there. Um, or there are these guys down on the, on the left, the um, the millstone group, uh, these, they're, they're looking for a site to store millstones, which in our book is neither in the public interest nor much fun. Um, so we, we focus on this top right corner here, things that are in public interest and that are fun. Uh, so here, here are a few. Uh, Takis, for example, the guy you already met, uh, he gets tables and chairs. Um, pretty straightforward. Actually, the senior citizens from the uh, nearby north get a bunch of tables and chairs as well. Um, the li local high school um, wants and generously gets a ping pong table. Uh, after the ping pong table spends a, bunch, a couple of months in, in, uh, in the courtyard of PS1, uh, the, uh, the Jacobs Ruiz neighborhood settlement house, uh, which provides social services to the uh, nearby housing projects wants and also by the wave of a magic wand gets a volleyball net after it has been held at PS1 for the summer and so on. So there's a lot of stuff, a lifeguard stand, a bunch of mirrors for the Long Island City School of Ballet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Here you see them all uh, plotted out and hopefully in action very soon. <laughs>